Just a fresh start. Just lift your hands and you see. There's a freshness that's right here, right now. A fresh start. And it's right here, right now. A fresh start. There's a fresh start, and it's right here, right now. There's a fresh start, and it's right here, right now. Oh, my, there's a fresh start, and it's right here, right now. Yeah. There's a storm. When the storm. Take me 
faut qu'il sait. Cause the great I am speaks over me. And I am what I am. Cause the great I am said he speaks over me. Would you say it's true?
All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Ridgeline Church. We're so glad you're here. I'm not sure where everybody else is, but we're here, and that's all that matters. So let's stand in worship. Thanks again for joining us. We know you could be a hundred other places, but we're so glad you're here. Here we go. salvation one doorway that leads to life one redemption one confession i believe in the name of jesus christ I believe in the crucifixion By his blood I have been set free I believe in the resurrection Hallelujah, his death is death's defeat All praise to God the Father All praise to Christ the Son All praise to the Holy Spirit our God has overcome the King who was and is and evermore will be. In Jesus' mighty name, I believe. I believe. Hope of heaven, he's preparing a place for me. Far beyond what hearts imagine, ears have heard or eyes have seen. I believe that a day is coming, he's returning to claim his bride. Light the altar, keep it burning, see the Lamb who rose and roaring. All praise to God the Father, all praise to Christ the Son, all praise to the Holy Spirit, because our God has overcome the King who was and is and evermore will be in Jesus' mighty ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How could I ever walk away from the one who saved my life? Oh no, I'll never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How could I ever walk away from the one who saved my life? Oh no, I'll never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How can I ever walk away from the one who saved my name? All praise to God the Father. All praise to Christ the Son. All praise to the Holy Spirit. How God has overcome the king who was and is and evermore will be in jesus mighty name I so all praise to god the father all praise to christ the son all praise to the holy spirit because our god has overcome the king who was and is and evermore will be in jesus mighty name I believe. in jesus mighty name I believe.
can be seated, church. Well, good morning, Ridgeline Community Church. Happy morning. Sunday. We're glad that you are here with us. Uh, for those of you I do not know, my name is Andy McDonald. I am one of the elders here at Ridgeline, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here, whether you're joining us here in person this morning or online, either this morning or throughout the week. Um, so if you are newer to Ridgeline and want to get connected with the church, we invite you to fill out a Connect card. You can find the paper copies of the Connect card uh, throughout the auditorium, or you can text the word CONNECT to 303-900-1294. It won't get you on a mailing list or anything like that, but it's our way to connect with you, see how things went for you this morning, and get you connected uh, to the life of the church. The same thing applies if you are connected here at Ridgeline and you want to get involved with serving. There are serve cards scattered throughout the auditorium, or you can text the word serve to 303-900-1294, and we'll get you connected with some of the different ministries um, or find out where it what is that you'd like to use the gifts that God has given you uh, to get plugged in. Speaking of gifts that God has given you, uh, as part of our regular offering and worship um, as members of Ridgeline, uh, we give tithes and offering. You can give online through the mobile app or check or cash in the box at the back. This is something that we get to do as members of, of the body here at Ridgeline uh, in worship uh, to God. But if you're our guest, we invite you to just worship with us with no obligation or no feeling that you need uh, to participate in that whatsoever. Now, there are a few things going on in the life of the church that we want to make sure you're informed of. So first is that the Ridge One student ministry, they had a winter retreat and then it got too wintry. So it had to get postponed. And now it's a spring retreat coming up later this month, April 26th through 28th, down at Sky Ranch uh, in Westcliff. So if you have a student in middle school or high school and would like them to go on that retreat, there's still just a couple of days left to sign up, so the urgency is there. But you can uh, contact greg.heredia at ridgelinecc.org. You can also register online through the church website, and the cost is $150. Next Saturday, that's... April the 20th, I believe, at 7.30 a.m. Yep, right there on the screen. April 20th at 7.30 a.m. is the men's breakfast. There are little uh, cards scattered throughout the chairs in the auditorium that will tell you more about it. But those cards promise me that there will be a hearty breakfast of pancakes, eggs, and sausage, as well as hearty nourishment from God's Word with Michael Mueller uh, speaking next Saturday. So men, be here right here in this room next Saturday from 7.30 to 9 uh, for men's breakfast. And for those of you who'd like to get to know Ridgeline a little bit better, either because you're interested in becoming members, so Ridgeline is a congregational church, meaning that matters of key importance are voted on by the membership. So if you'd like to become a member at Ridgeline to be able to participate in that voting, or you're just newer to Ridgeline and would like to get to know the church a little bit better, uh, we'll be hosting a Get to Know Ridgeline class on Sunday, May 5th, during second service downstairs in the basement. So for more information or to let us know you're coming, Contact me. It's my name that's up there. Uh, Andy.McDonald at RidgelineCC.org. Or come find me after service. I'd be happy to, to jot you down or tell you a little bit more about the class. So as we continue with our worship this morning, if you'll join me in prayer, we'll pray for our time together. We'll pray for other churches that are gathering in the city. And then we'll pray for God's missions worldwide. Lord, thank you for giving us a chance to gather together here today. Thank you for the beautiful weather that we've experienced this weekend. And I pray and hope that, that many of us have been able to get out and experience your, your creation and, and your wonder um, in just the, the beautiful, beautiful environment that we've been in. And Lord, we pray as we gather together this morning, some of us gather with, with joy and, and expectation of, of worship this morning, and then some of us gather with with heavy hearts or just with, with pressures and stresses that, that are on us. But Lord, I pray that for just the next little bit that you would help us to, to quiet our hearts and to join in a time of worship with one another, uh, to seek your word and to seek your truth. And Lord, we're so thankful that that's happening all throughout the world this morning, that's happening all throughout our country, and then that's happening all throughout our city. And so this morning, Lord, we pray for the Rock Church. We pray for the pastoral staff over there, and as they are uh, continuing their study of the Great Commission, we pray that that would be a meaningful time, that you would work uh, in their hearts just like you, you're working in the hearts of people here at Ridgeline this morning. And Lord, there are missions opportunities going on all throughout the country and around the world, and we lift up those missionaries. We pray for protection, especially in times of, of war and strife going on in different parts of the world. 
And then, Lord, we pray especially this morning for our supported missionaries, Kevin and Lindsay Dennis, down with Campus Crusade in Orlando. We thank you so much that they were able to join us here a few weeks ago and, and have time to share uh, their hearts and their testimony with us. And so, Lord, we pray that your, your work through them in Orlando would continue to be fruitful, uh, that you would continue to help them build disciples and, and mentor um, many people in your name. Lord, pray for our time together. Pray for Pastor Mike as he uh, delivers more of your truth out of Colossians. Uh, pray that we would uh, be open to hearing what you brought us here to hear this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.
Your mercy never fails me. That's right, you know it. All my days, I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up until the day I head by sin of the goodness of God. Of the goodness 
to sing that again just because we can just because God is so faithful and God is so good and God is so loving Gosh. and as we sing it I just want you to just let it rise up from deep inside you just let it wash over you because as, as I stand up here and I sing my conviction is that there's no doubt in my mind that God is who he says he is, that he's faithful and he's kind and he's just and his plans are for me. But you know what? If you're not there this morning, that's okay. It's really okay. If it's not your conviction that he's good, I still want you to just sing this over yourself and just pray for God's goodness. Because I think sometimes we sing things in here because we know they're true, but I think other times we just want to sing them until we know they're true. So with just the voices, we're just going to sing that chorus. Just all together, all my life. All my life you have been faithful. Just sing it out. All my life you have been so, so good. Every breath that I am. You are good, good. Oh, you are good, good. Oh, yes, you are good, good. Oh, you are good, good. this morning. We thank you for being in this place. We thank you for your spirit. We praise you for your faithfulness. All my life you've been faithful. You'll never let me down. You'll never abandon me. I believe in your goodness. I trust in your grace and mercy that is sufficient for me. Lord, give Pastor Mike the words that we need to hear this morning, words of encouragement, words of teaching, words of truth. Thank you, Father. It's this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, worship team. Let's express our appreciation today. I was thinking as we were singing that song about God being faithful all my life, and I, I came to Christ at the age of 19, and I can honestly say God's faithfulness didn't start when I got saved. I look back at those first 19 years, He was so faithful to take care of me, my family, and uh, to make sure that I made it to where I needed to be when I was that place of conversion. Well, we're going to be in Colossians chapter 2 today, but we have some slides I want to talk about first, a couple of slides here. We've mentioned ministry teams um, coming out of the transition team work that we did over a number of months. Um, we prayerfully decided on things, areas of ministry that we felt would be a help to the next pastor if we had some teams put together. And I'm so excited as I look at this. I see uh, serving community projects and the contacts, of course, David and Megan. And, um, you know, I think there's so many things that so many of us don't realize are going on with Ridgeline and the ministries of Ridgeline. Uh, we don't see them, uh, many of them. But I want you to know about them because God's working. And uh, as I think about this next pastor who's coming, 
um, he's going to be so blessed to have these teams on the ground already working when he gets here. Because all of these areas of ministry he's, he's concerned about. <laughs> I don't know who he is yet, but I know if he's a decent pastor, he's going to be concerned about these things. And we're going to already have teams in place. And these teams are not just sitting and waiting for the next pastor. And so uh, if you have an interest in working in community projects or serving, contact David or Megan Stark. Evangelism and Discipleship, Greg Heredia and Phil Garcia. That team has already been out on the street witnessing and inviting people to church. They're working on really interesting plans for deeper discipleship training. Um, and I think Greg Heredia will be telling us more about that as it gets developed. So if that's an area of interest, you know, I hear people say, well, we talk about evangelism, we don't do it. Yes, we do. And if you want to be involved in that, that team right there is the one to contact. Shepherding and congregational care, Andy McDonald or John Klingman. And uh, I hope that you'll uh, be praying for these teams. And, and if you feel like that's your sweet spot to take care of people in this congregation, I mean, that includes all kinds of things. It includes visiting the sick. It includes uh, taking meals to people that are unable to uh, take care of themselves for a while. And, 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 of course, it's a whole bunch of other things that have to do with spiritual welfare. And then uh, the singles ministry. Uh, we, Lincoln Ward and Kim Walton, are, uh, have been working, making plans, carrying out these plans to reach singles in our area. And, you know, we really have a, if you look at our demographic, we've got a, a gap there. And that's one of the reasons why the transition team wanted to begin work. Next slide, please. Uh, missions ministry, you already know. I mean, we pray for our missionaries. We've got 12 missionaries, I believe, out on, in, on the field currently. Um, and the mission team, uh, please contact uh, David Ward. Um, and then, uh, let's see, the communication ministry, Steve Adams. Communication is a really broad area. Steve is really good with working with the IT side, with our IT staff to, on the website and on increasing and improving communication for all of us and, and inside and outside the church. And then number seven, the grief share ministry. Vicki or Scott Workman are the contacts there. And I, we've talked about that. Vicki's been up here. You know, the one need that never stops is to help people who are in grief. Um, and so whether you currently have lost a loved one or you feel like God would have you involved in helping those that are grieving, we don't grieve as those who have no hope, and that's wonderful. But not everybody knows that. And it's actually a, not just a ministry for the people in our church. We're having people come from outside the church that have lost loved ones that find the website and, uh, and have been joining on Thursday evenings. Well, I hope you'll be praying for all those ministry teams. Um, turn in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 2, and I'll pray. Father, we're so thankful today for your love and grace. Thank you for what we've been singing about. Lord, we just love you, and, and when we sing and, and Lord, uh, worship you in song, uh, we hope that, Lord, it not only blesses you, but that it blesses us as well. And Father, I, I today pray for Israel. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We know, Father, that your hand is on Israel in a special way. And we know, Lord, that so much of the future is, uh, happens, the, the prophecies with the nation of Israel and and as we see the nations of the world gathering against Israel, we just pray, Father, that you will uh, continue to bless that nation, that you'll protect them, Lord, that you'll give them victory. And Lord, we just pray that you'll put that on our hearts and minds, even though in some ways it seems so far away. And Lord, now as we come to your word, we pray that you'll guide and bless our thoughts. Lord, I pray that you'll give me the words to say. And Lord, that your word will not come back void as you've promised in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Okay, we looked at chapter 1, and it was a big one last week, the preeminence of Christ. And in chapter 2, in verse 1, it says, for, Paul said, for I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. And we pointed out that there are ministries, there were churches, even as Paul was ministering as an apostle, planting churches all over the then known world. Colossians is one of those places that he did not visit or plant the church personally. And, and so he says, I want you to know, he's talking to a group of people that he's never met in this letter. And notice that he says, I want you to know what a great conflict I have. That word that's translated conflict there is struggle. And I believe it has to do with a burden that he carried. You might remember a few weeks ago we were looking in 2 Corinthians, that long list of, of trials and tribulations that Paul went through, everything from being stoned to being shipwrecked to being beaten um, and, and spending a day and a night in the deep. And, and when he gets to the end of that very long list of suffering, he says, and besides all these things, his greatest burden is for the churches. And so I, I really believe that what that teaches us here is that even though he had not yet met, in fact, as far as we know, he never went to Colossae, that he cared about them. He prayed for them. And last week we, we looked at that passage in John chapter 13 that Jesus said, by this you'll know that the world will know you're my disciples if you have loved one for another. And what that really means is loving the church. We prayed for the church in Castle Rock today. We prayed for missionaries. We need to be, especially in this day and age when we have global access, to be praying for the church all over the world, many of them facing terrible circumstances, and they need our prayers. And so the burden that he carried um, actually, at least in part, had to do with false teachers. Um, we've mentioned a number of times that there are false teachers. Last week we talked about in Colossae, you really had, you had pagans with false religion, and then you had Judaizers who were basically corrupting the, the Christian uh, doctrines and, and infusing in them work salvation. And, uh, and then, of course, you had the... Um, just people that were completely uh, the atheist, those that, you know, it's, it's like in Castle Rock, if we had some way to, I'm sure there's demographic studies, we would find that there are plenty of false religions even here in Castle Rock. And so his concern and his struggle, I think the burden was, he was worried about them. He was worried about what was happening to them. Now, he had sent Epaphras, and Epaphras was doing a good job. He planted the church. He was teaching the church sound doctrine. But this word actually that says conflict has the idea of agony. He has agony in his heart for them. And, uh, and then it says uh, in verse 2 that their hearts may be encouraged being knit together in love and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both the Father and of Christ. That's a mouthful. But that's really what we found in chapter 1. The fullness of Christ, the preeminence of Christ, the knowledge of Christ. And, and he knows that Epaphras is doing a good job, but he's concerned about the false teachers. It's interesting because the word that's translated encouraged there... Uh, you, you may have heard the, the term paraclete uh, or parakaleo. The Greek word parakaleo, it, it literally means the one called alongside. So when Jesus was talking about the Holy Spirit, you know, I'm not going to leave you helpless, but I will send a spirit after I'm gone, the Holy Spirit, uh, the paraclete, sometimes it's called, uh, to come alongside, to comfort you. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, it talks about that same word, and it says the comfort, parakaleo, the, the comfort that we've received, 
from God equips us to comfort others, to come alongside other people and give that comfort that God's given to us to others that are in similar circumstances. But as I looked at the way this word is used here, where it says uh, that their hearts may be encouraged, it's interesting. Um, I had, had not realized it, but that word does not always mean uh, encouragement in the sense of comfort. It literally here means, the way it's used, to put courage in. <laughs> you know, we don't think of encouragement as, as being putting courage in us. But uh, in a number of the, the word studies that have been done looking at the way the word's used in this context, I believe it means that Paul thought they were losing heart and that in, in some ways not just discouraged, but maybe really down and out so that his prayer for them in, in this epistle and his purpose in writing was that that they might literally be receiving courage to stand up. We're going to see that. To stand against the enemy. You know, it's one thing for us to gather here this morning and not have anything to worry about in the sense of persecution or anything. But what happens when there is persecution? There's a verse in the Old Testament, that, and I think it's in Kings, that talks about if you get weary with the foot soldiers, what will you do when the horses come? And I think in a sense that's the horses came. The false teachers were there. They were being attacked. And, and so Paul wanted them to be courageous in their faith. And I believe he certainly wants us to be courageous in ours. And notice that he, he wants them to be knit together in love, attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding and knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and Christ. It, the way that happens, the way we get courage, the way we're encouraged in that sense is by being built up in the Word of God, being built up in the, with the Holy Spirit. And um, it's interesting about, you know, for him to say that the, they might be knit together. You know, that, has, that speaks to unity. You know, I've, I've been working in churches, not just as a pastor over the years, but as a church consultant, working in churches that are undergoing tremendous conflict. And one thing that conflict does in a church is, besides just damaging relationships and causing people to leave churches and, and to suffer uh, emotionally and spiritually, one of the things that conflict does in a church is it gets the church off mission. Uh, as I've gone in as a consultant trying to work with churches, I've seen churches that they were full steam ahead. They were making great progress. And then they got into a conflict, and the conflict divided the church, and the church got off mission. Well, I believe what Paul's saying here is you need courage and you also need unity. The last prayer that we know of that Jesus prayed for the disciples, sometimes it's called the uh, high priestly prayer, and other times it's called the disciples' prayer. And in John 17, I'll just read three verses. I do not pray for these alone. So he was praying for the disciples. And if you go and read in John 17, he's praying a long prayer there for the disciples just before he uh, was gonna, he knew he was going to be crucified and then be separated from them physically. He said, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Who's Jesus praying for? Us. We know the Lord because the disciples shared that glorious gospel and faithful believers shared through the generations until now we know the Lord. And Jesus, in that moment, before he was even crucified, was praying for the disciples, the twelve. But he was also praying for us. And so he says, I don't pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe uh, through their word, that they may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. 
that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I and them and you and me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Now, what that really is saying is, God, I pray for Ridgeline. I mean, he didn't call us by name, but he said all those people that are going to believe. I pray for Ridgeline that it will be knit together uh, in love and attaining to all the riches. And I think in a way saying that unity will keep us together so that we can be courageous standing for the Lord, growing in grace and knowledge of the truth, just as he was hoping for the Colossians. And then in verse 3 it says, In whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now this I say, lest anyone uh, should deceive you with persuasive words. So you might say, well, it, these are believers they seem to be orthodox in the sense that God, uh, Paul's able to commend them for what they believe, and yet he's still concerned about them. And he's praying that not only will they, they and not only that we would be unified and be courageous, but then he mentions that treasure that's hidden inside of us. Remember a few weeks ago when we said, talked about having the treasure in clay vessels, earthen pots, that treasure of the glory of the gospel of the Lord Jesus that's inside of us. He's talking about that here again. And then he says, I say this lest anyone should deceive you with per persuasive words. And of course the implication is there are a lot of silver-tongued devils out there. There are those that can spin what they're saying and make it sound like truth when it's really, it's not. It's falsehood, false doctrine. Doctrines of devils. And, you know, we think, okay, well, we know better than that. Uh, we're not going to be persuaded by those people. I read some time ago that the cults, as they grow, and the cults are growing all over the world. I think I mentioned as I've traveled the world with Compassion International, everywhere you go, there's Mormons. Everywhere you go, there's Jehovah's Witnesses and all kinds of cults everywhere in the most remote villages. And I read not long ago that, that their source of new people is often from evangelical churches. Did you get that? In other words, they are drawing away and making captive in false teaching people that attend churches like ours. How do they do that? That's what Paul's teaching and preaching and praying about. The way we can become strong and courageous and, if you will, immune to those false doctrines is to know the truth of the Word of God so well that when somebody speaks falsehood, we recognize it. And even if it's a silver tongue that's, that's beautiful oratory, we see right through it. You remember the, in the book of Acts, chapter 17, when it talked about uh, those in Berea were more noble than those in Thessalonica because they searched the Scriptures daily to see if those things were true, what the apostles were teaching. And so I remind you that as much as by God's grace, I'm trying to tell you the truth week after week, search the scriptures daily to make sure these things are true. Saturate your lives with the word of God. That's the way we discern truth from error. In speaking further about um, unity in Philippians chapter 2, Paul, while talking to the believers at Philippi, said, Fulfill my joy by being like-minded. So Jesus prayed for us in the high priestly prayer 
that we would be one with God and one with him and one with each other. And Paul says, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Now, that doesn't mean we have to agree on everything. Sometimes we have to agree to disagree on things that are like secondary issues. But on the main things, the primary issues, the, the major doctrines, the truth of Scripture, the deity of Christ, the inspiration of Scripture, we're unified. And then it says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, as I've worked in churches that are in conflict. Oftentimes, the division that's happening is not over the deity of Christ. In fact, I remember one of my professors in seminary saying, I'll be surprised if anybody stands up in one of your churches and says, I deny the deity of Christ. Now, that probably happens in some places, but it's probably not going to happen here. Rather, the devil uses the little foxes to spoil the vine. He lets our ego or our preferences about things that are not that important divide the brethren, divide the church, cause conflict. And so he goes on to say, um, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each other esteem one another better than himself. Think about that. We read these words, and sometimes I think they just kind of pass over us. We, do we consider the, the concerns of others more important than the concerns we have? So often there's, you know, disagreement and arguments about things that it's because it's my way or the highway. When what Jesus prayed for and what Paul prayed for is that we will keep the major things major and the minor things minor and not allow the devil to divide our church. Now, I'm not preaching this because I know of major division in the church. I'm preaching it because it's in the Word of God in the book of Colossians that we're studying. And because it, it, it is important for every church. He goes on to say, let each of you look, look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. So we might disagree on something, but the Christian spirit, the spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit wants us to be more concerned about other people than we are ourselves. That's who Jesus was. That's the man hanging on the cross who said about the men that drove nails into his hands and his feet, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Do we have that humble spirit of Christ? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, we're still in Philippians 2, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. In a way, I believe that what it's saying is, it's kind of like Paul says in 2 Corinthians, he was willing to give what he had, what he owned, his money, his property, in order that the Corinthians be blessed spiritually. But he, he said, I'm willing to spend, not only to spend, but to be spent, to give my life. Are we willing to give our lives for, for others? And I don't think that always means to die. I think sometimes I heard somebody say one time that, you know, God will give us dying grace if we have to be martyred. It's not that hard to die for Christ. The hard part is to live for Him. And I believe verses like this challenge us in the way we think as Americans, especially where we're independent. We don't want to be dependent on anybody. We our, we're always right. I'm as guilty as anyone. But the Scripture calls us to a higher standard. And so, coming back to Colossians here, it says, in whom, verse 3, are all the hidden treasures of wisdom and knowledge. 
Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with per persuasive words, for though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. So he's not there in person. He's just writing them a letter. You may remember I said, I think it was last week, that prayer, somebody said, is a blessing at a distance. I got an email this week from somebody in another state that was watching our service. And they said, I'm sending, I think it was a text instead of an email, and said, uh, I'm blessing you from a distance. We can do that through prayer. And then in verse 6, it says, As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. It's interesting, this rooted means it's, it's a verb that's talking about the fact that we came to know Christ and that happened in the past, so we're rooted in him. That's salvation. But then as it continues and says, um, therefore, as you've re received Christ the Lord, so walk in him rooted and built up in him, established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. And the, the tense of the verb there changes so that it's not just our salvation in the past, it's what we're doing now. We're abounding in thanksgiving. It's continuous. It's the doctrine of sanctification. We become more like Jesus when we obey the scriptures. Another verse that is, I think, very interesting is found in John 7, 17. It says, and listen to this because it's talking about knowing the will of God and doing the will of God. It says, if any, this is uh, in John 7, 17, if anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether, in this case, he said, I speak on my own authority. I believe what he's saying is that we know that the words that are in Scripture are inspired. The people that were listening to Paul at the time, there was no New Testament. He's just now writing it back then. But he's saying that not only do we need to study to learn God's will, not only do we need to study to, to understand this wisdom and knowledge that he keeps talking about, but the only way to really make it ours and to be discerning is to desire God's will and to do it. It's so easy for us to be armchair Christians and just sit and soak up the truth and sing praises to God. But the question is, are we taking those truths and applying them, allowing the Holy Spirit to apply it to our lives in a way that transforms us and changes us and makes us humble and makes us care more about other people than we care about ourselves, makes us have a burden for people we've never met, to get that glorious gospel to them so that they don't die without Christ and go to hell. I believe John 7, 17 says, it's not just head knowledge. <laughs> We've got to actually be obedient Christians. Remember that old hymn, Trust and Obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey? It's only half a proposition for us to understand with our heads. We have to live it out in our lives. And that's what he's praying for the Colossians. So he says, rooted and built up in him and established in faith. So the establishing of us in the word of God, the, the Colossians is who he's talking to, but it's all for us too. As we have been taught, Epaphras was teaching them the truth. Timothy was teaching the truth. Paul was teaching the truth. These churches that were being planted we're getting the doctrine of that once delivered to the saints. We have that. In fact, we have it in a book, <laughs> which they didn't have. And then it says in verse 8, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, 
according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. And so <clears throat> he's warning again, be careful, there's deceivers out there, don't be deceived. And he talks about the tradition of men. And of course, you know, my thoughts go first to the Jews. Jesus rebuked the Jews because they had all kinds of traditions that were of men and not of God. What about us? Do we have traditions that really aren't clearly in Scripture and, and yet we would fight over them if somebody disagreed with us? That's what we talk about primary and secondary issues. There are things worth dying for, and there are things not worth arguing about. And I believe the only way to know the difference is to be a student of the Word of God. Well, then he talks about, uh, in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him. And then in verse 11, in him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of sin of the flesh, and by the circumcision of Christ. Now notice he's talking about circumcision. And then he says, buried with him in baptism, in which you are also raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. He puts those two side by side. He puts circumcision, which was the mark of the covenant in the flesh for, the, for Israel. And then he, he mentions baptism. And he's basically, I think, talking about the difference between symbolism and substance. In other words, circumcision didn't save the Jews. It was a symbol of a substance of a coming Christ. Baptism doesn't wash away our sins. The blood of Jesus washes away our sins, but we still are baptized. It gives us a symbol. Um, uh, in Hebrews chapter 10, I believe this is what he's talking about. It says, for the law having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with these same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make uh, those who approach perfect for then would they not have ceased to have been offered for the worshipers once purified would have had no more consciousness of sins but in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. So it's not the baptism that saves us. It's not the circumcision. that it, They were symbols, but what it is, it's the faith that we have in the Lord Jesus and his blood. And then in verse 13, it says, And you being dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that is against us and was contrary to us, and he has taken it all out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing of them. So he, he, he's washed away all our sins. We don't have to sacrifice animals. And even the things that we do by ritual are not the things that save us. Well, as we finish this chapter, it says, So let no one judge you in food and drink or regarding a festival or new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. So he starts warning the Colossians, don't get confused about the things that are external. Uh, don't think that these external rituals or the food that you eat um, is, is what is spiritually the most important. Let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and the worship of angels, intruding into those things. So even, you know, you've got religions out there that even call themselves Christians that worship angels and worship Mary. And not holding fast to the head from which all the body nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments grows 
with an increase that is from God. Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why are you living in this world? Do you, as though living in this world, do you subject yourselves to regulations? Verse 21 talks about legalistic regulations. Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle. It's okay to have a diet. It's okay if you choose. I had a close brother. He didn't want to eat meat at all. He ate vegetables. But he didn't believe that that made him more spiritual. We can do what we do, but we have to be able to discern between spirituality and legalism. It's not works that saves us, which all concern things which perish with the using according to the commandments and doctrines of men. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility, and neglect the body, but have no uh, value to us in the indulgence of the flesh. Well, the scripture says, do not love the world nor the things of the world in 1 John. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust thereof. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Once again, a a chapter with a lot of stuff in it. I want to close, though, by uh, just taking a look at Ephesians chapter 6 and remind you of the the armor of God. Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand an evil day and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having girded your waist with the truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all taking the shield of faith which is which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word <clears throat> the word of god praying always with all prayer and supplications in the spirit being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication with all saints let's pray father thank you that you have given us the full armor You've given us the word, which is our sword. You've given us uh, the breastplate of righteousness. Lord, you've given us faith. You've given us the gospel. May we live our lives uh, immersed in your truth so that we will discern and not be persuaded by false teachers and be able to instruct others also and win men and women, boys and girls, to Jesus Christ. For it's in your name we pray and trust. Amen. Perfect.
perfect submission all is at rest I am my Savior I'm happy and blessed watching and waiting looking up And he 
heard and he answered That's why I trust him That's why I trust him I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered That's why I trust him That's why I trust him I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered That's why I trust him That's why I trust him I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered I sought the Lord and he heard I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered That's why I trust him, that's why I trust in God My Savior, the one who will never fail He will never fail somebody to be praying with you about. You know, we pray for you, but we can't pray for things we don't know about. And so if you would like to meet with one of our elders or with me up front as we close the service, I invite you to come up and we'll pray with you. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. God bless you.
Says you blow him away. <laughs> you blow him away. When you just be who you were meant to be, his heart is moved. His heart is moved by you. Just wanna move your get caught within your gaze. Get caught within your gaze, right here in your presence. God is where I wanna stay. Hold just to dwell in your house. Waste my hours and my days on you.
Y'all give it up for the legendary Cody Khan.
storms made way for spring in every season from where